Hello and welcome. I am Sam Robinson, psychotherapist in Austin, Texas. I'm here today with Dr. Robert Elliott as a part of a series of interviews with expert practitioners of different forms of experiential psychotherapy. In this series, we interview a wide variety of experiential practitioners so as to compare and contrast the thinking and techniques of different experiential methodologies. Dr. Elliott is an emeritus professor of psychology at the University of Toledo in Ohio and an emeritus professor of counseling at the University of Strathclyde in Scotland. They're one of the founders of emotion-focused therapy, and their main current activities are doing training, supervision, practice, and research within that approach. Recent books include Emotion-Focused Counseling and Action and Essentials of Descriptive, Interpretive, Qualitative Research. The second edition of Learning Emotion-Focused Therapy is forthcoming in 2025, and they have published nearly 200 journal articles or book chapters. Wow, I'm excited to have you here today, Robert. I'd love to jump right in. I hope I didn't. I hope I did you justice in that intro. Oh, okay, it's fine, Sam, but thank you. Good. It's a pleasure Good. to be here. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, thank you for making the time. Mm. Yeah, so I'd love to hear, let's kind of jump right in, and I know EFT is your specialty. I'd love to kind of hear um, if you consider it experiential and what kind of ways it is, is it experiential. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's experiential because it's organized around experience, right? I mean... Uh, and particularly the client's experience, uh, I came to uh, what became EFT through my interest in clients' experiences because I was a, a, a researcher, uh, you know, studying how change occurs in psychotherapy. This is the, you know, my PhD research is in the 1970s, and and I got the position at, at the University of Toledo in Ohio in the late 70s into the 80s. And, and I was studying, really fascinated in what clients experience within therapy sessions. Um, and in a way that kind of took me to experiential therapy uh, because although I was trained quite eclectically or broadly in the 1970s and, you know, I mean, person-centered to begin with and um, psychodynamic, a lot of my supervision was psychodynamic. Uh, I did training in family systemic therapy uh, I, I dabbled in uh, behavior therapy and, you know, proto, you know, this is even before cognitive therapy developed, right? I dabbled in that. So I had quite a, you could say, unsystematic or, or, or um, eclectic education, um, but I was always really super interested in what clients experience in therapy sessions. And that led me eventually to give up the psychodynamic. I mean, the psychodynamic stuff still sits there in my head someplace, but but um, to give up feeling like that I would want to interpret my clients, you know, tell them stuff about them themselves that I thought was true about themselves that I thought they didn't know about themselves that I got, you know, pretty much was able to let go of from my psychodynamic training. Yeah, so it is experiential because it's organized around the client's experience. And of course, we're at EFT, we're particularly interested in emotional experiencing, which we see as the kind of core of experience. Um, and, you know, we're also, you know, like, you know, influenced by Gene Janlin, who was a colleague of Carl Rogers, who developed focusing, you know, so that kind of experiential, um, that's always been on our, in our DNA and EFT. Um, yeah, and also, I mean, when we, we got asked, like Les Greenberg and Germain Littar, psychotherapy researchers in, Bel in Belgium, in the early 90s, we got asked to do a, an evidence review like, what do you know about, what's the research tell us about humanistic therapies? And for us, it was always humanistic dash experiential therapies. And so we've kind of like defined this kind of approach that has, you know, values the relationship and empathy and client experiencing and, you know, sort of autonomy, you know, freedom, things like that, choice, right? personal agency. So we always, and we kind of try to define these approaches, right? Um, that, you know, don't have strong, what we call content directive, you know, like we don't tell clients what to do, you know, in their lives. We don't, you know, tell them things we think they don't know about themselves, you know, so, you know, that that's part of also what we understand experiential to be, right? You know, is grounded ultimately in the client as an expert on their own experience, right? And so, yeah, so EFT is one of the, uh, a number of different humanistic experiential therapies. 
you know, that also include gestalt and in some kinds of psychodrama and of course person centered and focusing oriented and and some some of the body therapies also right so and i mean if that's the stuff you guys you know you interview folks like us right like me right for that yeah so that's yeah eft clearly yeah fits in there yeah, yeah. wow i have so many questions just based on what you shared um, <laughs> okay. i was curious just personally sort of having that psychodynamic background and uh -huh, training uh -huh. and then even all the systemic stuff was 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 your ways of working that way not feeling fulfilling or as as fruitful with clients or what was it where you were like yeah this isn't my jam or yeah i mean the systemic is is in eft to this day i mean eft also integrates systemic you know both thinking about the person as they're located within their family immediate family system and larger systems and also the the, the systems within the person right between the different parts of the person, um, you know, so so the, the system, the psychodynamic was is maybe more complicated. Um, you know, I mean, my original training was person centered. My very first psychotherapy training, Jerry Goodman, a student of Carl Rogers, UCLA. Um, but then, like almost all my supervision was psychodynamic, and I got I read fairly heavily in the what was happening in psychodynamic therapies in the 1970s. But you know, I mean. I'm an oldest child. My, I have memories from my childhood uh, of my mom saying at the dinner table, you know, I say something and my mom goes, isn't he clever, right? You know, and there was something about like being into like being clever, right? And the psychodynamic was always, you know, for me about cleverness and letting go of some of that cleverness because like, you know, it never really fits the client's experience exactly right. I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, so there's a kind of frustration with having having to be and trying to be clever when what what I feel most fulfilled in doing is just tuning into the client's experience and helping them deepen that experience in the moment in the session. Does that, you know, I mean, I had to let yeah. go of it. Um, I can tell you a story. I mean, if you like the story, I mean, so when when we were starting to develop what became EFT, this is 1986, um, I said to Laura Rice, so the, the three of us who developed EFT were Les Greenberg, Laura Rice, and myself. And I was kind of the junior partner in the, the three of us. Laura Rice studied with Carl Rogers, so she was a Rogers student. Les Greenberg studied with Laura and did Gestalt training, right? Um, and I said, Laura, I'm really attached to being clever, right? I'm to interpreting my clients. And like, I want to let go of it because it's not, it doesn't feel fulfilling for me anymore. And I don't want to do it. And she said, I'll tell you what I do, <laughs> which is really, I mean, that, I mean, that Laura struggled with that too, right? I mean, I tell you what, I'll tell you what I do. Uh, and that's what I say to myself, no matter how clever you think your interpretation is, what your client comes to in the work, in the therapy, is always going to be more richer, more subtle, fit them better, you know. And I realized the problem with psychodynamic interpretations is not that they're they're too clever or they're too complicated. That there is that they're they're almost always too simple. And and that helped me let go, right? And mm -hmm. letting go of that, and then really digging into the, you know, one the discipline of one approach. An experiential approach that's grounded in the client's experience. Um, I felt like I had, I came home to myself as a therapist. So this is like, you know, I've been practicing since 73. I'm like, you know, 12, 13, 14 years into my career as a therapist. Um, and this this feels like me, right? I mean, I've been doing bits and pieces of it since I heard Les and Laura present at a conference in 1977. I mean, I heard immediately I started using two chair work and unfolding, that's Laura's task, systematic evocative unfolding, immediately. So been in my practice since 77, but then I could let go of all the other things and just purely work in that approach. And that really felt liberating to me. Yeah, I was gonna say, it must've been somewhat of a relief to be like, oh, I don't have to give them the nugget, golden nugget interpretation now. They're gonna, they're gonna reveal that to me through this work, exactly. which are really, which is a really, it's kind of a lot of the experiential methodologies have that mm -hmm. kind of empowering stance of right. the client mm -hmm. is the expert. The, mm -hmm. the job of the therapist is to draw out emotional learnings and knowings yeah. rather than saying, hey, I think this is about your mother and, <laughs> you know. Um, 
So it's easy for you to to let that go, or was it? Because it sounds like that has roots in early life. That that was something about you that was really praised yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. coming up with that. So I imagine it's it, it letting... still. I mean, Sam, it still pops out. I mean, I I, I, can't, <laughs> I mean, I had one client, and occasionally I. Yeah, I saw her for many, many, many sessions. Uh, and occasionally I'd pop out with some sort of like, you know, transference or interpretation or something. And she'd go like, Robert, you're over-interpreting. <laughs> Which I loved, right? Yeah, I just love that. The clients, you yeah. know, pull me up, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, okay, so it's really focused on client experience. And there's mm -hmm. also, so you've been able to incorporate like the person-centered, the mm -hmm. attunement stuff. Mm -hmm. What's it like? You know, when a client comes to you or has come to you in the past, what's mm -hmm. how are you like conceptualizing the issue that they bring? Like, say a client comes and is like, oh, I'm, you know, I have low self-esteem. You know, how does one how does an EFT therapist in their mind kind of conceptualize the client and maybe what treatment might look like, that kind of thing? Sure. Right. I mean, because we have a kind of one of the things that's developed in EFT over particularly over the last 20 years is case formulation. Right. So originally when we were developing EFT in the late eighties, you know, we didn't do much with case formulation, but that's become increasingly important. And so, you know, when a client comes in, we're thinking, you know, first of all, what are they here for? What, you know, what's, you know, what's broken in their life, you know, and then as we work, begin to work with that, we hear like the, what we call markers, you know, so your client that comes and says, I have low self-esteem. I mean, in my experience, that almost always means that there's a harsh internal critic, right? That's just, you know, that's just client talk for having a harsh internal critic that makes you, makes you feel bad about yourself. Right. You know, so, so I hear the, I begin to hear the marker implicit in the client's presentation. The marker is a, the indicator of the client at some point down the road, when the relationship is strong enough, we're going to, you know, do some kind of two chair work with their, their negative treatment of self, their harsh inner critic, you know, so we begin to hear the markers. And then we also start listening for the emotions, you know, like, so low self-esteem, you know, there's like, I feel bad about myself. Okay. So then there's going to be some psychological pain there or emotional pain. There's going to be um, maybe some low mood or something. So we begin to listen for what are the emotions implicit in that presentation. And also, of course, as we explore it with the client, then emotions begin to come out, right? And we're listening particularly for what we call poignancy. Poignancy is like, that's the, that's the thing that hurts in it. You know, like that's the thing that you hear it and you kind of feel a twang in your, in your body, right? You know, like, or a, a sinking or, you know, but, you know, we listen for those signs of pain poignancy and we make sure we pick those up you know from the first session you know this is this is something that hurts in your life it's something that's sad or it's hard or it's painful right you know so then we're so we're working towards the emotion and then um we begin to hear how the person treats themselves and you know their sense of self identity and you know so if there's a self to self relationship of attack and you know, putting down and that sort of thing, or if, you know, we also hear it's self to other, other to self, you know, and then, you know, like, um, we're also listening for how they process their emotions, you know, like, am I, you know, is the client, you know, like, pushing the emotions away by going in their head, or are they you know, like jumping into telling you long stories, or are they, you know, like, going to their you know, aches and pains, and they're, you know, so are they restricting their emotion, or are they actually able to tell it engaging, story that draws you in so that's a kind of working mode emotional processing mode you know so or do they get overwhelmed and flooded or get completely cut off and numbed you know so that so we're listening for the emotional processing modes right um and so th that's already the the foundation for an eft case formulation and then that the the case formulation that gets done is a kind of I'm now calling case formulation work a meta task in eft so it's a, it goes alongside of in parallel to various kinds of other kind of work you're doing in the therapy. Um, and particularly, I mean, I have a student who's been doing research on the case formulation process in EFT and, you know, and, you know, particularly, you know, like at the, at the after a piece of therapeutic work, a task, or at the end of the session, you know, we make some space to make meaning out of the work that we've been doing. Um, and, you know, to build a story with the client about how their process works. So that's, you know, that's a whole thing on case formulation. But yeah, so, that's that's how we would, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I was going to ask. So, are you are you transparently doing this with the client, or are you just conceptually in your mind, like noticing, mm -hmm. okay, this client's mm -hmm. in their head? You yeah, just because yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering about that. If a client comes in and they're telling you a story about self esteem uh -huh. and it uh -huh. shows up at work and the boss does this and that and that, and are you then transparently no noticing? out loud like oh i'm i'm seeing that you're processing this thing that kind of feels like there's some pain to it but it feels maybe you're in your head or disconnected or how does that yeah yeah, yeah. like so, it's so, a goal yeah, I mean, to like nudge them into the mm -hmm. emotion sure yeah so i mean so we're listening for it and then we're beginning to find ways to uh you know offer what, I, what we call process reflections right so i might say so i guess i can hear that there's a part of you that's really drawn to like other people and is kind of really focused on other people or i hear there's a part of you that kind of really wants to figure things out you know like i don't want to say you know externalize you're going to want to say you know like uh, intellectualizing because that's pejorative right you know i want to like kind of reflect to their process in a way that feels friendly to their experience right um yeah so we're beginning to pick that up and 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 reflect the process in that way um yeah in an yeah like you're yeah, you're not wanting to shame the client or, you know, well, it mm -hmm. looks like you're just intellectualizing here. So you need yeah, to yeah, no, feel, no. yeah. So you're just like reflecting in a in an inviting way um, for them to consider how they're sharing with you what they're sharing. Right. right with right. the goal of kind of helping them deepen into their own inner experience more than anything. Yeah, and, and particularly, you know, I mean, assuming that they're reasonably well re emotionally regulated, right? Um because you can't do any experiential work if the person's flooded or they're completely numbed out, right? So it's assuming that they're reasonably well regulated, they're likely when they come into therapy to be in what we call a restricted mode, which is like going in your head or going to your body or jumping into act, kind of action impulsive. So we're we're gonna pick that up, but we're listening for their capacity to um, you know, like actually slow down, look inside, use their body to access their emotion or tell you us tell you and them a story that actually brings the emotion rather than pushes the emotion away or their ability to you know like access an emotion and then symbolize it so conceptual i mean so so using the the conceptual symbolic processes in a way that's grounded to the emotion and doesn't push it away I mean, so we're listening for their the working modes of emotional processing right mm -hmm. yeah yeah trying to support the development of those Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. so what's the what's the um but what's eft's end goal with a client is that is that too yeah to, of the question to, yeah i mean to really be able to access i'm going to switch into the first person here so if i'm imagining my client i want my to, i want to be able to access my emotions you know rather than push them away. I want to be able to regulate them enough so I can make use of the useful information that they contain um, and um, then deal with anything that's getting in their way. But, but basically, you know, EFT uses this emotional deepening process. It starts with, you know, people be maybe in their head or, or um, kind of in global distress. And there's a kind of series of steps you know, and the steps go from secondary reactive emotions, which are emotions about other emotions, they're more pushing emotions away, and the two primary maladaptive emotions, which are old, bad, stuck feelings, that feel like the story of my life. So that's a deepening to move from a secondary to a primary emotions already deepening. And then within the old, the old, bad, stuck feelings, the primary maladaptive, there's what we call core pain. That's the thing that hurts the most. And so we're trying to help the person get to the core pain and explore it fully with us and feel accepted in it. But also we want to ask that thing that hurts the most, what does it need? Yeah, I mean, what does it really need? That thing that hurts the most, right? And the need that's associated with the core pain then points to movement forward, it points to adaptive emotions. It points to, you know, usually what we call, you know, connecting sadness, sadness that connects us to other people, um, anger that's not defensive, but rather makes a boundary, protects um, and asserts a boundary, and self-compassion. Those are the sort of three most important adaptive emotions that come out of accessing core pain. And so it's helping the person move all the way through those different layers that are kind of getting in the way to get to the primary, adapt the primary maladaptive, 
the core pain and then the adaptive and that adaptive motion helps us move forward, helps us do what we need to do in this situation. Is that making mm -hmm. sense? That's, that's yeah. the, to do that. To get, yeah. So really getting to the core, essentially the wound and, and discovering what that really needs, that part of you. And that can take work because you're having to sift through the layers of exactly. defenses yeah. and yeah, 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 you, yeah. you said primary emotions and all of or secondary emotions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. kind of complex. I'm thinking in my mind. It's complex, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, the human emotion kind of... system is very complex. It's evolved over millions and millions of years. Mm -hmm. And right. And it and then it gets tangled up in over the course of our life, you know, in complicated ways, layer after layer, right? I mean, so yeah, it takes time to work through it. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, it's honoring the the complexities of our systems. Because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I was thinking about, yeah, clients coming in and what if they're sort of, you know, this, these are probably doozy questions, but, you know, if you have a client that's saying, this is, this is as deep as I know how to go with this particular thing I'm experiencing, or, yeah, yeah, okay. um, you know, really kind of stuck high level, you know, in the in the self-esteem stuff with the boss and just up here and story and we, are you assuming there's something really important in this client's life that makes it important not to go deeper or, or are you just staying with where you are and just continuing to try and fold them closer to the core pain i mean i think both things are true and especially with different clients and at different times i mean there is you know ways that we people get commonly stuck with their in their emotions right i mean you you know we can you know like push the the painful emotions away with other emotions so we get angry at ourselves for being a uh, feeling ashamed we feel ashamed of our sadness or something you know so there's these these secondary reactive emotions that push them away and that's that's a pretty universal thing that that, that people do use emotions in those ways and you know also we get you know we get stuck in old bad feelings that we call primary maladaptive, um, you know, because usually because of bad experiences, like often traumatic experiences that we had, you know, like I've worked a lot with with the social anxiety, right? And so people who are afraid of other people be, and almost always because they've experienced shame, they've been humiliated, you know, by peers, by their family, you know, and so um, the, the anxiety, the fear of other people is really keeping the shame away. You know, I mean, and so these are, you know, I mean, millions of years of human evolution, learning how to like, you know, duck and dodge around your emotions and avoid pain. And, you know, I mean, all, I mean, it's, you know, it's fine, but, you know, it, it makes it complicated. Yeah. So, right. You, I, let's see if I answered your question, because I have a feeling I might have wandered off. Let's. No, I think it was good. I was okay. just sort of, well, you, you would indicate that, yeah, it's, it's both could be true and how you would oh, yes. yeah. help, a, help a client who seems to be stuck up here and, yeah. You referenced um, like the primary maladaptive. So you mean you in EFT, it's maladaptive in the present, but you're assuming exactly. that at some point it was adaptive. Yeah. Like you said, exactly. could, it right. protects me from the shame and humiliation I felt. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Yeah. yeah it doesn't you fit find... the situation anymore because it's really about the past more than the present. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm aware that that's also a definition of transference. <laughs> this is our version of transference, right? Yeah, I mean, just saying. Yeah, yeah. interesting. But also, it, it's, um, well, you're just empathizing with the coherence of the problem pattern that the client yeah, has, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. really, a uh, again, like a lot of these methodologies have that kind of non-pathologizing stance about stuff. Right. Although right. not all of them choose the word, use the word maladaptive. That's that's that can be somewhat controversial. I mean, mm -hmm. some, you know, some of the Sue Johnson, the sort of Sue Johnson branch of EFT don't like to use the word maladaptive. They say there's no such thing as a maladaptive emotion. And I had, I was at a conference in Denmark a few years ago on uh, on on fear, and that had like everybody from theologians to uh, you know can, you know biochemists studying fear, right? You know, and there were a bunch of animal you know ethologists. People study animal behavior, and um, there's tons of like relevant stuff in, you know, like like predator prey, you know, uh, interactions in the environment, uh, like you know, um, uh, wild you know mountain lions and deer, you know, things like that, you know. So, and so they were offended by me talking about primary maladaptive fear. They were so offended that they 
they got up early the last day of the conference and had breakfast with me to explain to me how that, you know, this thing you're calling primary maladaptive fear is actually adaptive, you know, that, that, that organisms have the ability to develop these chronic stuck fear reactions and, and they have them because it helped their ancestors survive. Right. I mean, you know, and they, they can point to predator prey interactions, you know, like if you're a, you know, a deer and you've been attacked by a mountain lion, you survived and you can tell, you know, we can tell by looking at the deer because they've got like the, the talon, you know, scars from the attacks, you know, you know, so if you can, if you've survived a, pre a, a predator attack, you know, like you're going to be changed forever by that. And if you aren't, the next predator that comes along, they'll kill you, right? You know, so, so that you're more, you're more jumpy, um, you're more, um, well, you're, you're, you're not as healthy because you're spent a lot of time watching, monitoring, being jumpy, you have fewer children and they don't do as well, but you survived. And if you didn't survive, that puts your reproductive success at zero, <laughs> right? You succeed, you know, so, so miserable life is better than zero, right? Uh, I mean, and they, they were, and I thought, well, thank you guys for telling me about this. This is really interesting. And I agree with you that in many ways, calling it maladaptive is a misnomer, um, but, you know, like, it is making the person miserable, right? And it is more about the past than the present. And it might have survival value overall, but but in the lives of our clients, you know, like lots of like, you know, with social anxiety, it just ruins people's lives. Right. You know, so it's it's maladaptive in that sense of just making people miserable. Yeah. Is that I mean Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And you're also not saying it's always been maladaptive. You know, you're no, you're clearly no, no. you're clearly saying this has been protective. For yeah, this yeah, person yeah. Is part and of it's also, life. I mean, like the word maladaptive, I always have to, when I teach, I say the word maladaptive, that just means not useful currently, right? And it's not, I mean, we're not trying to call it names or it's not like, a, I mean, it's not meant to be pathologizing. It's just not working for you now, right? I mean, that's what it means. That's all it means. Similarly, adaptive just means it's useful, right? So I want to just kind of, I mean, I don't like jargon very much. So I kind of want to like, you know, kind of what, um, clarify some of the jargon in terms but demystify it i think that's the word i'm looking for right yeah uh -huh. yeah yeah because one could interpret maladaptive as like oh you're saying it's bad and it's wrong and it's all, all this other stuff you're just saying it's not working with how this person wants to live their life right now so and it's causing you pain right yeah yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah okay good um let me think here so okay. is there is there um okay so let's imagine with you know the guy with the self-esteem and you get to this core pain is there specific kind of techniques that EFT draw from? I know you said Gestalt is, is kind of an experiential way of working, but when you get yeah. to that point I mean, and, you, yeah. and you're discovering what what could be the um, corrective, is it corrective, would you say, corrective experience? You say that corrective emotional means? experience, right, yeah. Uh -huh. Like, is there ways, is there techniques that facilitate applying that corrective experience to the core pain? Sure. Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't like to call them techniques, right? <laughs> we like to call yeah. them tasks, you know, but I mean, yeah, because, you know, our students come along and they want to learn techniques, you know, they come along for the training, you know, I say, you know, they come for the chair work, um, but but they stay for the empathy, you know, because that's really, the, that's the thing that makes the chair work work, right? Yeah, so of course, EFT, you know, uh, integrates person-centered and gestalt therapy. I mean, it's, those are the primary influences, um, you know, focusing is in there as an influence, we have a bit of existential therapy also as an influence, but it's primarily, you know, like 90% person-centered and, and gestalt, you know, and, um, and, you know, CFT has a lot in common with gestalt therapy, I think, including the role of the therapist's emotional presence with the client, you know, the authentic kind of person-to-person, -person, you know, that we, we share a strong value or not with gestalt therapy. Yeah, so, okay, so techniques, or tasks as I prefer. Tasks. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we hear the markers. And the most important thing is the marker. You know, that's the thing that that's the thing that client says to you that set, tells you that they might be ready to do a particular kind of therapeutic work. So the client says, I have a I have low self-esteem. We might say, So tell me about that. Right. Because that's just a label, right? You know, what do they what do you mean by I mean, I told you at the beginning that that almost always means is a harsh inner critic, but but actually tell me, what do you mean by self, you know, low self-esteem? You know, what do you, you know, what do you say to yourself? What do you do? What, what's that like for you? 
And, you know, then the client starts saying, you know, I just don't feel very good about myself. I feel like, you know, no one really wants to be around me or no one values what I have to offer. And then you say, okay, so really it feels like, you know, you're just kind of almost kind of all alone. So now we hear more of an interpersonal kind of thing to it, you know, and you know, we're not with that presentation, we're not hearing the inner critic yet. There'll be an inner critic in there someplace, but, but so we're not going to push it. We're just going to go, okay, so tell me more about that. You know, where's this come from or what's this like for you to feel so alone? Well, and then we start hearing, you know, my, my girlfriend broke up with me. You know, my parents never had time for me. We start hearing, maybe we hear some, un, another marker, which is like unfinished business or, you know, unresolved interpersonal, you know, issues, right? Uh, with other, other important people. So we hear the marker for unfinished business. And that would suggest to us that, you know, down the road, after at least three sessions of therapy, we could consider offering that the client imagine the girlfriend or the parent in the other chair and saying what you wish you could say to them. So empty chair work, right? And the marker is the unfinished business. You know, if the client had told us, if we if it had gone a different way and we heard, you know, I just feel like I'm rubbish. You know, we start hearing this self-critical stuff, right? I'm rubbish. I have nothing to offer. That's why people aren't don't don't want to be around me because basically I'm a loser, right? So we hear the critic. This is negative treatment of self, right? Uh, we hear the self-attack, uh, and maybe we hear the person talking about, and I feel so low. I feel so worthless, right? That's the we call the experiencer, the part that gets the negative treatment of self. Okay, so now we hear, and so three or more sessions and we would then say i wonder you know i wonder if you might want to you know have a conversation between because the, there is this part of you that really is quite critical right and so i wonder if you could come over here and maybe show me how you criticize yourself what do you actually say or do to yourself right and so we move into but you know the relationship has to be strong enough because to do chair work um i mean think about socially anxious clients a socially anxious client is comes to the therapist and generally expects the therapist to shame or humiliate them because that's their experience. They're afraid of other people because they've had all these this history of being humiliated and shamed. And so here's another, particular if their social anxiety is about unstructured social situation, you know. So 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 they the socially anxious client's not going to want to take their eyes off of the therapist for at least three sessions, because if you do chair work, you know, we're now asking you to look at the chair, right? And if I'm highly social anxious, I'm going to say, well, what, what's my therapist thinking about when I'm doing this stupid thing they want me to do, right? I mean, you know, so they're just not going to be, so they have to have a dealt an internalized sense of us as someone who cares and is interested in not judging them. Enough of that by, you know, it's usually three, four sessions before they can even, we even consider doing chair work with, particularly with something like social anxiety. So then, so in the meantime, in those first three sessions, we've been, you know, hearing the story of the low self-esteem or the story of the loneliness and the abandonment and neglect. And we've been ref beginning to reflect towards, so it's like a part of you that's critical or there's like somehow this relationship, it just feels like you just, just still need something. So we're reflecting the markers even before we do the task. And, you know, I say when I teach that the markers are more important than the technique or the task, the thing you do, the most important thing is to pick up where the client wants to go. That's in the marker. And so we start kind of pre-chair work before we do chair work. Is that making sense? Is that, I mean, yeah. You know, yeah. But the empathy is the critical thing, right? I mean, that's the, you know. Yeah, I really like, um, so yeah, self-esteem or social anxiety, just as phrases are pretty vague. So you're, you're yeah. starting with fleshing out the specificity Absolutely. of that with the patient whilst yeah. listening for the sort of implicit meaning or markers that mm -hmm. indicates some emotional stuff to it yeah. and then that helps you facilitate the experiential work later on or down the road yeah, yeah, or whenever yeah. whenever you're sensing that the client feels safe enough to do that and we start to hear the pain right i mean mm -hmm. you know bits of pain come out with poignancy and then we're reflecting those and then we're beginning to get up beginning to formulate with them of the th you know the things that really hurt in their lives mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and i really like what you're saying that that's that's probably not going to happen or happen very well if you're not empath empathetically attuned and you have the presence and really the um, ability to hold what's what's surfacing as it surfaces up as rather than just being like, well, hi, first session. Hey, we're going to do some two chair work because that's the technique I know. 
<laughs> that's right, like, right. yeah, you know, that's yeah, that's my tool. That's my hammer. I know how to bang <laughs> on things with, right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's really it. Really is. I like what you shared earlier about it's not it's not about the technique. It's more about the 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 holding, the, and the, the, holding, the therapist the two men, mm -hmm. um creating that safety with the client yep. and then also, and using the um tasks as, as you would call them to deepen into the work when it feels safe for the client and feels appropriate and and it and it's has an intention to it too it's not just let's let's throw this at the wall and see if it sticks you're like offering them uh, a time to give voice to that pain and yeah yeah mm -hmm. i'm just laughing at your metaphor of throwing things against the wall and seeing what sticks i mean i think there's always a certain amount of that in therapy isn't there actually right i mean we try something and see what happens right and even when and, and even when there's a marker you know like you know we try it and and it's maybe a matter of working with the client to figure out how they can do chair work that won't make them feel excruciatingly embarrassed or something or how we can i mean there's always this sort of creative process and how we're going to implement it with a given person yeah so really about well there is some version of yeah throwing it at, at the at the wall seeing if it sticks but it's also about letting go of the outcome you want to you know what i mean you're just like let's yeah, yeah. this is a task that could hopefully help this client deepen into their material mm -hmm. if it doesn't work we 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 adjust we make it fit mm -hmm. for this client okay that's good because yeah you, i can imagine the sort of fear of like it's not working the other chair is not responding <laughs> what's, the, what's yeah, going yeah, yeah. on and of course i mean i do i do tons of supervision sam so so my supervisees especially beginning eft therapists they're all like that process you just did like you know they're going help help you know they're not you know it's not working right and they come and they say how do i get my client to emotionally deepen this is the most common question in eft supervision and it's like i go like first of all you know like only your client can make themselves deepen right <laughs> you know you can't make them you don't have that superpower you know, you can't make them deepen, but you can give them opportunities to deepen. And I think maybe in some ways, more importantly, you can get in the way of their deepening. You know, therapists have a, a great deal of power over interfering with clients' processes. Um, we can offer them opportunities to more, move for, forward and deeper, but can't make them do it. Um, you know, we just have to create conditions that where they will be more likely to be okay with with going towards their pain right does that i mean totally yeah, yeah. do you have <clears throat> as um as you're doing all of the supervision are, are there are there things that jump out as really interfering with the deepening process that you've noticed from trainees and could you speak yeah to it's like bit? it's like um what do i do next like you know they go what in their head what do i do next oh help it's not working um my supervisor is going to be angry with me because i'm not bringing in chair work i mean all this nonsense that goes on in people's heads and you know increasingly as a supervisor i just want people to let go of supervisees to let go of that you know i mean and just be with your client and then let the markers find you and your client i mean it's like don't go in there for trying to force a process um yeah, yeah. So and so I'll say, so what was going on with you right then? And I work a lot with recordings. You know, we EFT, one of the things about EFT is we don't believe what therapists tell us about therapy sessions. <laughs> we don't we show me the data, show me the recording of the session, what actually happened there. Right. So like, you know, like so what happened? So we say, okay, that right at that moment, you know, when you I could see it looked like you were going into your head there, you know, with your client. And you could, what were you experiencing? Well, I was feeling anxious. I didn't know what to do. I'm going, I'm trying to think, you know, I go like, okay, so that means you're in your head and you're not in your body resonating with the client's experience. I mean, I understand that. I was once a beginning therapy student myself, right? I know what that is. I remember what that felt like, you know? And I also remember what the how liberating it's always felt to me to let go of worrying about those things just to con completely resonate with the client and fall into their experience with them. I mean, that's, you know, and then, then the, the, the pieces, the concepts, the markers come out of that, but this, this basic stance needs to be solidly empathic and resonating with your client. Yeah. Does that... Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So it's almost, I mean, the, the approach strikes <clears throat> me as bottom up, but it's also yes, bottom up for the therapist whose mm -hmm. goal is to sit with what's happening and yeah. get into your own felt sense. And then when it's necessary, 
think about the next step to do what you want to do exactly. right, yeah. rather than starting up here like okay i've got to do this and exactly, that yeah. so it's experience Which, first and then i mean so we're not i mean you know eft we say you know like we're you know it's connecting the head and the heart it's both the head and the heart are important right you need the the, the conceptual you know but it needs to be grounded in the experience so that means experience comes first and then you make sense out of it or we make you know, together we make sense out of it um yeah, so not 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 conceptual first, and a lot of our, us are conceptual first learners. We like we feel more comfortable if we're learning stuff from our heads first, um, you know, cognitive organizers, and you know, I mean, and I mean, I guess we are in class that makes sense. But when you get into, a, I mean, I tell my students, you know, when you go see your client, leave my book outside the door. I mean, like you know, the books for after the session, right? <laughs> you know, then pick it up and see what what looks familiar in there. But like, yeah, let go of that if you can. But it's hard to do. Yeah, I just, I just had a funny thought of, you know, saying to a client, hold on a second, I just got to check my book quickly. About book, right, exactly. <laughs> what yeah, yeah, yeah. what oh, do we do? Yeah. What did Dr. Robert say? Oh yeah, page eighty nine. <laughs> right, yes, exactly. For, for yeah. years, I had, in my office when I was in Toledo, I had this diagram of unfinished business, empty chair work, up on my bulletin board, and like it was about, you know, like six. Eight, I couldn't read it from where I sat. In my chair doing therapy but it was so reassuring to know it was there <laughs> there's a model right you know somehow yeah uh, that's brilliant yeah that's great um okay great so this is really interesting i'm wondering now you know on the kind of learning about this part for people what's what seems to be the most tricky thing or aspect of this methodology to grasp for folks well, I mean, EFT has got a lot of theory, right? And people get over, you know, can get overwhelmed with the amount of theory. We, we've we spent 40 years developing a very rich and highly complex theory about how change occurs in therapy. Um, that's that's challenging, but I think it's more challenging to, you know, like be experientially present with your clients and then connect the theory to that, you know, so that... I mean, I think where people get stuck, I mean, lots of us are smart. Maybe we did well in school and we like theory and we can read theory fluently. We can even talk theory fluently, but, but, you know, translating in that into presence with your, our clients, that's maybe going to be for some of us just too much or too far. And, and, you know, I mean, all of us learning therapy, you know, I don't know about you, but when I, I spent years after I started to learn therapy in grad school, being not sure whether I had it in me to do it. You know, I mean, I was, I was like five years or more into it. And one day I walked out of the session with a, with a teenage client I've been working with. And I said, maybe someday years and years from now, I might be good at this. Up until that moment, it hadn't occurred to me, or I had no assurance that I could ever be decent at it. Right. So we bring this huge amount of vulnerability to learning the therapy. And then, you know, we, you know, if we were right, we might then, you know, be really good at the theory, but it's really hard to implement it. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the hard, the, the hard places I think people get with the sheer complexity uh, and then with the really applying it in an experiential wide way in the session. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's so much going on. Like you need the theory, like you said, but you need yeah. the, bottom you need that felt bottom sense up, connection right. to the yeah. client which i which i imagine is really tricky to teach you know they can't just write on the whiteboard okay just you know because you're you're wanting it to be an experience mm -hmm. that, experiential thing yeah. yeah it is really tricky to teach right and i've spent quite a bit of time thinking about and writing about and even doing research on how people learn therapy trying to incorporate you know like ideas about pedag you know, therapy, psychotherapy pedagogy. How do we actually teach this in a way that, that people can use it and learn it? Um, and, you know, so it's clear to me that you, that we need a kind of quite a multimodal kind of education process, you know, where there is theory, of course, but there's also, we, we play lots of video examples in our training. Uh, people do experiential practice in where they're in the client and therapist role with each other, working on real problems, not role playing. Um, then there's supervision on your own practice. There's self-reflection. There's, a, I think there's a place for personal therapy. Um, you know, so all these different modalities is even, even research, you know, people who do research on psychotherapy talk about how much they learn 
and how much it helps them to develop their therapy skills by doing research. Um, you know, so all those things kind of come together, you know, and, and you know, because when you, you learn a, ther a, th a therapy, you're learning what we call an emotion scheme, you know, which is a, you know, it's, it's grounded in a feeling, but then it's got, you know, examples and instances. It's, you have, there's a bodily feeling of, there, there's, there's how you can symbolize it and there's what you actually do. <laughs> and what you actually do, like, is only a small, tiny part of it, right? So learning, you know, something like empathy is a very rich process. And then it needs lots of different kinds of input to help people learn it. And of course, different, different people have different learning styles. So they, some people get helped in different ways by different things. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's tricky. But I mean, it's, um, it all seems um like necessary to have all of those key ingredients to be able to yeah. facilitate this type of change with people. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it would be, you need one and the other. You need the presence, empathetic attunement stuff, mm -hmm. plus the mapping it out conceptually from an EFT lens. That's the case formulation. And then the theory, yeah, and, yeah all that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You said early on, actually, like I think one of the, one of the first sentences you said was um, about psychotherapy, change how it changed the research you did in like the 70s and i was thinking what was the what were they saying in the 70s that was about how psycho how therapy helped change people yeah i mean going back right um i started out there were like all these helping you know like uh, helping skill training programs you know like you know like teaching and teaching reflection and teaching kinds of question asking and teaching so there was these skill training you know helping skill training it was a whole movement in the seventies. Right. And, um, I wasn't sure that it was based on sound assumptions about, you know, like, you know, when, when therapists ask questions, you know, they're not always trying to find out information. So my, my PhD research actually asked clients when your therapist I played them bits of their session, when your therapist did said that, what do you think they were trying to do? And so I asked, what's the client reading the therapist's intention as? And then we had what the therapist thought their intention was. And then there was what the skill trainers were telling people to do. And, you know, so I, you know, I found a lot of the assumptions that these skill training uh, programs were based on were quite simplistic that, that, you know, the therapist behaviors were more rich than that. And, and clients were reading them in ways that weren't the same as what they, the skill trainers thought they were. So that was just one of many different things. And, and that took me to an interest in client experiences and how different, clients experiences are from therapist experiences often and how you know even from what you get from looking at a session you know so this this idea that there's a whole world of the client's experience that the therapist doesn't necessarily know about and i've got lots and lots of examples in my research where you know the therapist told me that this is what they thought was going on and the client tells me something completely different or vice versa that you know the client thinks the therapist is being empathic and the therapist is thinking about the dentist they just went to right i mean um you know so i saw lots of that kind of rich kind of wonderful stuff happening in therapy sessions and it was just a hunch you had about this you you were like i don't know if this doesn't quite add up about yeah yeah just a hunch, right i think yeah that this is mm -hmm. too simplistic right yeah and i wanted to know what was really going on yeah i mean my i've always been really interested in the experience of the other mm -hmm. you know I mean, you know, I, as I as I sit with you in this in this interview, I kind of wonder, you know, what's Sam, you know, where's he right now, and what's he, what's going on with him, right? You know, so I mean, I've always been really interested in the, the experience of, of the other, and that takes me to empathy, you know, sort of understanding the other, and that, you know, you know so then, you know, for us as therapists, the other, the the great other is that we often don't know, even if we think we do, is the is our clients, and I think it's important to be modest about the limits of our ability to read our clients' minds. I mean, sometimes we can do amazing work empathically, but other times we have no clue, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. there's that. Yeah. yeah, sorry, that last question kind of took us back to, to early on in the conversation. Um, but yeah, I was just curious. And um, so, yeah, we've got sort of five minutes or so left. I'm, oh, I'm sure. thinking about people who want to dip their toes into this type of work and yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know what's what's a good first step for them well um you could you know do a one-day training you know i mean we we offer a fair amount of the fair number of those um there's actually quite a lot of um um 
uh, like little Les Greenberg, like, you know, little things you can sign up for. I haven't, I don't know exactly what they look like, but so there are some, there's stuff out there on the web. Um, Les and I both have videos. Also, people like, you know, Rhonda Goldman and Gene Watson have some videos too. So you can take a look at the videos. You can look at our books, but, you know, I'd rather, I'd recommend starting with something fairly straightforward and simple like like the learning like the not not my learning book the um emotion focused counseling in action that was written as a kind of first book of an eft um and so that one is right makes it engaging it's you know it's it's not as complex as the learning emotion focused therapy book which is the one that i'm <laughs> i just finished the, the second edition it's like 700 pages it's huge it's you know because so much has happened in eft in the last 20 years since the first edition so that's not a good jumping in place right but like the one of the simpler books like lots of timulac has a i think uh working with emotional pain in therapy so timulac is 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 a good starter book in eft and the and people just love the emotion focused counseling and action book they just mm -hmm. find it really inviting and engaging and um so that's a yeah the sage you know yeah, so that's that's great. those are some things to do. And, you know, I know that your website has videos uh, or has links to, you know, mm -hmm. EMT videos and things like that. Right. I saw yeah. also on your website that you have um, don't have any demonstrations of EFT and it would be really fun to develop. Some EFT demonstration videos. Yeah, we would love that. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah we so I mean demo sessions are so helpful to mm -hmm. see what we're to talking see. about right now in live yeah. action is great. I never believe what what a therapy says about itself until I see the practice, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah. show me what show me what it looks like. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um what about Robert people curious about just developing their own uh, therapeutic presence in the room? Any tidbits on how to deepen into that? Yeah, so Sherry Geller, Sherry Geller um uh, has published several books on therapeutic presence that are, I mean, she's an EFT therapist, but she has a broader perspective that includes mindfulness and Buddhism and things like that. So she comes at it from quite a broad perspective. So Sherry Geller, several books on therapeutic presence. Um, that's a good one. Um, uh, gosh, I just think about, you know, like learning. I mean, for me, it's been so much about just being interested in other people and mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. wanting to get to know them and things like that. And um, you alluded to it a little early on, just about doing your own work. So perhaps even finding an EFT therapist, therapist. and, and yeah. experiencing it from that side of the aisle. I think most EFT therapists really would benefit from or could benefit from an experience of EFT, you know, EFT, EFT delivered by a, a skilled practitioner, usually supervisor level or, or higher. But yeah, yeah, there's that, right? Yeah, yeah good. Yeah. Well, well great. This, this has been, has been really rich. Mm -hmm. I know I could go on for ages, but I want to yeah. be conscious of the time. Um, sure, but yeah. we'll we'll um, make sure we post everything that you've shared with us under underneath the video and stuff. Right. And any links that you've shared. Um, okay, we can work on me sending you know setting you up some you know, yeah, like some readings or something like that with links and things like yeah. that. So we can do that. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, well, Robert, thank you so much. This yeah. has been a real honor and I, my mind's churning now of ways that I can incorporate this into my own practice. Wonderful. Thank you thank so you much. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Yeah. It was a real pleasure talking to you. Yeah, you too. Thank you.